My name is Aaron Loenberg, and I'm a senior policy analyst with New America's Early and Elementary Education Policy Team. Our Early and Elementary Education Policy Team here at New America works to help ensure that all children have access to a system of high quality early learning opportunities that prepare, prepare them to thrive in school and in life. Today, we'll hear about how three states are building an equitable and aligned early learning system for children birth through age five. New America is happy to partner with the National Institute for Early Education Research to highlight this exciting work. I'll now turn it over to Lori Connors Tadros, a senior fellow at the Institute. Thank you so much, Erin. It's really been a fantastic partnership and thank you to the events team. Um, very, very helpful. We're really excited to welcome you uh, today to hear from Washington, Minnesota, and Rhode Island, as Erin mentioned. Uh, they are on a journey to build an equitable and aligned early learning system birth to five to have full access to quality early care and education. And as, as each of you know, this is challenging work, it's time consuming work, and it really takes a village. Uh, so we'll hear more from them and their partners about their successes and their challenges. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time in a facilitated discussion hearing about uh, some of the bumps in the road and some of the ways that they've addressed um, political realities, funding realities, access realities, equity realities, and where they are right now. Um, and they'll conclude with a little bit about where they're going forward. Um, and we're very fortunate to have some resources uh, for you all that are available from um, the federal government, which we will share around the Early Childhood, Early Childhood State Systems Collective Impact Project and a peer learning community that we will be launching uh, actually shortly. So we'll talk about that. We do encourage you to please uh, put comments and, and uh, resources or questions in the chat, or I, I mean, excuse me, in the slidle and we'll, we'll access that. Uh, next slide, please. So the goals of the webinar are you are you know fundamentally for you to actually get excited about uh, some of the opportunities and progress that are being made in the states that we're featuring here. We know there are many other states that are working on these issues, and we're, we would also love to learn more about that. Um, I think by hearing their processes and approaches, that may help you problem solve or move forward in your own state work or local work, actually. Uh, we know that this isn't all about, uh, there's a lot of enabling conditions, and we've certainly all been through a pandemic and still really dealing with that. But um, there is an opportunity now to really look forward um, for how we can build stronger, more equitable and aligned systems. And as I mentioned, we will share some resources with you so that following the webinar, you might have an opportunity to continue to get support and, use, and um, do this work. So we can go to the next slide, please. I'm really excited. The next section will be uh, an opportunity for you to hear from each of these states and just a couple of their key partners, actually. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it now. Oh, well, excuse me, go to the next slide. I'm going to introduce and just tell you about the state presenters uh, because we're really pleased and I thanked them uh, that we have um, a fantastic representation from these three states, Karen Gantz, who is the birth to three and pre-K ECAP, which is their early childhood um, program administrator in the Washington State uh, Department of Children, Youth and Families, which coordinates with their Department of Ed and others. Um, Nicole Rose, who's the Assistant Secretary of the Early Learning Department of Children, Youth and Families, will be talking with you in a few minutes about the Washington State work. In Minnesota, um, we're joined by Jennifer Moses, who is the task force, the great start for all Minnesotan Minnesota's Children, uh, Task Force Co-Chair, and she's pro Program Director of the Minnesota Children's Cabinet out of the Governor's Office. Shakira Bradshaw is a parent of a child under five, and she is another co-chair of the task force. And Sandy Samar also is a co-chair. Um, Anna Quinn coordinates all this work, and you'll hear more about this as a legislative mandate. And they recently um, are going to be releasing a report. And from Rhode Island, the great state of Rhode Island, we are going to hear from Kayla Rosen, who's the Director of Early Childhood Strategy at the Rhode Island's um, Office of the Governor. 
Lisa Nugent, who is the Director of State Pre-K at the Department of Education, and Nicole Cello, who is the Director of Licensing in the Department of Human Services. So lots of great perspectives um, that we'll hear today from these three states. Um, please go to the next slide. And now I'm going to turn it over to Nicole Rose, um, who will be speaking on behalf of the Washington team. Great. Thanks, Lori. And I'd like to just give uh, Karen a moment to say hello as well, if we could let her um, say welcome to everyone. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here with you. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Nicole. Thanks. So we're excited to talk about um, what we're doing in early learning in Washington State. And as I was reflecting on this, um, it really actually took me all the way back to race to the top. And so I say that um, to say that we've had a long history in Washington to really get us to where we're going. Um, the Early Start Act in 2015 was really our state investment and commitment to making sure we carried forward the great work of the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Grant. And if we go to the next slide, um, what you'll see is that in um, 2020-2021, um, we had a huge landmark investment known as the Fair Start for Kids Act, which was a $1.1 billion investment in high quality, affordable childcare and early learning in Washington state. And one of the things that um, I really love about this act is that it is focusing on, I think, a variety of things to really make the system go, go as a whole. Um, so we know that really at the center of what we're doing are children and families. Um, but we also know that providers really need to have access to the tools and training that they need to be able to meet the needs of kids and families that are coming into their program. And so we really focused on with this act, um, looking at affordability, accessibility, quality, and then again, supporting our providers. And one of the things that we're really committed to is family choice. And so we want to make sure that families actually have a choice of early learning options that meet their needs where they want them. And we want to make sure that that program best meets the needs of that child and family who's coming through that door, whether it's state funded preschool, whether it's a high quality child care, whether it's home visiting. Um, so really making sure that that continuum of options is available. I think that we all know the pandemic highlighted sort of the broken market and the um, real need of providers to have some additional supports to meet the needs of kids who are coming into their care. And so there are some great investments as it relates to trauma-informed care, um, equity grants, meeting the needs of uh, complex needs of children who are coming through the door that the Fair Start for Kids Act does as well. And then again, all of this is really in support of making sure that kids have what they need for healthy development. So when we talk about affordability and accessibility, some of that sometimes means increasing our income eligibility limits. And so in Washington state, that meant making a change from federal poverty level to state median income. In programs like childcare where we have a copay, it also meant really capping that copay. Um, part of what it also means for us is how do we continue to align eligibility requirements for our kids and families so that we make our um, systems a bit more easier to navigate. So we've not only looked at eligibility requirements, but we've also been able to put more slots out there. So we've added over 500 plus more pre-K slots and we're serving more families through home visiting. So we're excited about the work that we have done. If we go to the next slide, um, part of what this will show you is a little bit of, of what I was talking about around, we wanna make sure that families and children are getting what they need where they need it. So we have a strong mixed delivery system in Washington state and families can receive services in a licensed family home and a child care center in outdoor preschool. And yes, even as it's raining here in Olympia today and in Washington state, we have kids who are in outdoor preschool in their rain gear. And then we do have quite a few of our kids who are served in schools, either by Department of Children, Youth and Family run programs or by our partners at the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. So a variety of settings and a variety of program elements that we're trying to um, implement as well. And that is anywhere from licensed childcare to making sure that we have a strong quality foundation through Early Achievers, which is our quality recognition and improvement system in Washington State. Families may be accessing childcare subsidy. 
they may be accessing early childhood education and assistance program or ECAP, our state funded pre-K, and we do have a birth to three ECAP as well. They may actually be receiving both of those things, subsidy and ECAP. Then we have a strong partnership with Head Start and a lot of our ECAP contractors actually do both Head Start and ECAP. And then again, we see the work of our partners at the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction as they are implementing developmental preschool and then transitional kindergarten, which is really um, a program that is serving those that are four years old in the school system. When we know that access is an issue, um, putting all of these things together really is how we're trying to maximize serving the most children possible. And if we go to the next slide, one of the things um, that we have been tasked with doing as we think about this is making sure that we are working really collaboratively with our partners at the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. And so um, we have something that's called a proviso that is asking us to work together and is really asking us to think about what are some of the administrative efficiencies or long-term strategies that are really integrating these programs. Often um, families might not know what program they're in, but they know that they need access to something. And we wanna make sure that that's as coordinated as possible for them. So we've been working very closely with our partners to make that happen um, and have a joint report that is coming out soon um, that will talk about what are some of the things that are really needed to make this um, work. And on the next slide, I can tell you a little bit more around what are some of the key things that we've really focused in on. And so I talked about access. And as we think about access, I think all that we knew about supply and demand changed a little bit um, after COVID. And so part of what we really have to do is understand what's out there and also understand what is it that families want and need. And as we think about that program capacity and making sure that um, enrollment is barrier free for families and that braiding and layering funds is, is administratively burden free for providers, we've got to make sure that we know how those things work together. And so really thinking about how braiding and layering works and then thinking about what are potential barriers and opportunities around enrollment for families. And I think one of the things I would note is we can talk about that at the state level, but it's also really important to us um, that we have regional and local conversations about that um, as that's where families and children are really receiving those services. I talked a little bit about quality. And we wanna make sure that where children and families are going, that they are accessing a high quality program. And so making sure that families know what to look for as they're thinking about quality. Also thinking about what does quality mean for our professionals? What are the things they need to be able to know, see and do um, in order to promote quality? And then what are the trainings, coaching, ongoing mentoring that are available for providers as well. And what are things that are available to them at their fingertips? Maybe not something that they have to leave their classroom for all day, but what is that quick tip that they can go to to access resources? I talked about a variety of settings and a variety of program types. And so you might be thinking, well, how does a family know what program they're eligible for? And how do you coordinate that recruitment and enrollment? And that is something that we are actively working on um, in our state. And that's a real place where we see some things that are happening locally that are really great, where you may have um, a school district who is using one screening tool to say, is this child and family eligible for this variety of programs, but what's the best one that's going to meet their needs? So they may use an ECAP screening tool to see if they're eligible for ECAP, developmental preschool, or transitional kindergarten. The other thing that we're exploring is how are we thinking about how we're communicating about program options for families, really thinking about this in sort of a larger sort of what is our public awareness campaign, not that we're there yet, but it's really thinking about what are all the different options that are available for families, um, and how do we make sure that they make informed choices. And how do we also make sure that there's enough program availability for them so that they have true family choice. Um, in where they are accessing services. 
And then data. I don't think we can talk about serving kids and families sometimes without talking about data. And I think we also know that um, our data systems can be disparate. So we have information about child care sometimes in one system, state funded pre-K in another, transitional kindergarten in another system. But how can we take a look at those, bring those together, think about what is it that we really need to be able to share with families and to know about families as we think about program enrollment uh, and think about some next steps there. So um, lots of work happening, and I would say lots of work um, to still be done, but excited about our partnership with OSPI and all of our other local partners like Child Care Aware, um, our educational service districts, and all of our ECAP contractors and Head Start grantees. Thank you. <laughs> the classic Zoom mistake. <laughs> I, was, I said something brilliant and you all didn't hear it. Um, but thank you so much, Nicole. Really appreciate hearing a high level overview of the journey that Washington State has been on. And I, I was reflecting that possibly it was almost 20 years ago that we first met when you were working on Race to the Top. And um, you certainly, you know, done a lot, a lot of work to build to build a great system, and we'll hear more about it in a minute. So now it's my pleasure, we can go to the next slide to introduce the Minnesota uh, lead, uh, Jennifer Moses, and she will introduce her team. Um, I forgot to mention that um, Minnesota, Rhode Island, and Washington, they participated in a peer learning community that we hosted last year, and um, that's how we got to know a lot about their great work and their great team. So um, Jenny will talk a bit about the Children's Task Force, but there's a lot of other work going on in Minnesota. So Jenny. Thanks, Lori. I'm Jenny Moses again with a program director with the Minnesota Children's Cabinet. Um, we coordinate work across the 22 state agencies on behalf of children and families. And I just want to share for those of you who are thinking about endeavoring into this work, um, we couldn't do it without a team. And as Lori mentioned, the team goes well beyond this. But for today's um, Great Start for All Minnesota Children Task Force work, I am just honored to be joined by my co-chairs, Sandy Simar, who is an early educator with Head Start, and Shakira Bradshaw, a parent of children under five who are in early care and education programs. So living this at the moment. And then as Lori mentioned, one of our um, key um, ingredients to making this all happen has been Hannah Quinn, our coordinator, to keep us on track and really making sure the timelines are followed and 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 speaking to the legislation. So um, you'll hear from each of us a little bit with the exception of Hannah, um, who can jump in if we lose our way, as she usually does. But first, I'll turn it over to Shakira to get us started. Thank you, Jenny. Um... Oh, we are so glad to be here with you today. I'm Shakira Bradshaw, as Jenny said. I'm one of the three co-chairs for the Great Start for All Minnesota Children Task Force. Um, I'm a parent of two kids in the EC system, so our task force work is of great importance to me. I'm sharing a bit about the background of the task force, which was proposed by early care and education advocates and legislators in signing the law in 2021 by the Waltz Vatican administration. The legislation establishing the task force had bipartisan support. We were asked to develop a plan and implementation timeline that ensures all families have access to affordable, high quality, early care and education that enriches, nourishes, and supports children and their families. This work is to develop a long-term vision for the state. The implementation timeline must begin in July of 2025 and finish no later than July of 2031. Our task force has 15 voting members and 15 non-voting members, and we represent many aspects of early care and education systems in Minnesota. Voting members include legislators, center directors, licensed family care providers, school, center, and Head Start-based educators, and a, and a member of a federally recognized tribe. Non-voting members include representatives of advocacy and business organizations, as well as state agency employees. Three of us with you today serve as the co-chairs. Legislation directed the task force to meet monthly between November 2021 and the submission of our final report by February 1st, 2023. I also wanted to note this evening 
um, that we have evening virtual meetings that allow for, for participation from across the state, including providers who cannot participate during regular business hours. Our final deadline is coming up and we have submitted a draft report by our December 15 deadline. And I'll turn it over to Sandy now who will share more about our process. Uh, next slide, please. And thank you, Shakira. And to address the aspects of the ECE system required by establishing legislation, task force members reviewed existing reports, materials, and recommendations. They convened two working groups to meet monthly in addition to the full task force who researched and provided additional analysis and draft recommendations to review for the full group. Um, those working groups included the family and provider affordability working group and the workforce compensation and supports working group. We also drafted, revised, and voted to approve recommendations for inclusion in the final report. As we started our work together, we also found common ground and a few essential commitments. First of all, to identifying historically disenfranchised groups who have not experienced equity in the ECE system. The group agreed to center equity throughout their process of developing recommendations. And a formal acknowledgement of a commitment to the mixed delivery system, recognizing that all types of providers and settings provide value to families and children, and family preference must be honored and respected by design. Acknowledgement that care and education cannot be separated. Every single experience a child has is a learning opportunity, making care and education inextricably inter intertwined. And these commitments helped our group focus and move forward in finalizing our recommendations for the state. And I'll turn things over to Jenny to share more about these recommendations. Thank you so much. And I'll just highlight again, a couple of the pieces that have already been shared, but one of the things that has allowed for considerable engagement and involvement of such a large diverse group of stakeholders was that we part of the legislation allowed for us to um, utilize virtual meetings, which in our state, state open meeting law was not previously allowed. So folks had to be in place and in person. Um, so just as you're thinking about how you might implement this in your future, thinking about those things, because it has been incredibly helpful to have those 37 voices be a part of the conversation. But um, thank you. Um, and I'll keep us moving so we don't um, miss out on this. We can go to the next slide. But as we've mentioned, our final report is not yet published. It's due on February 1st. We did submit the draft, as Shakira mentioned, in December. But I wanted to highlight a few of the major recommendations shown here. It's a 92-page report at this point. So there's a lot more we haven't included here. So we'll make sure you all get the link and can dig in deeper. But we wanted to give you the big picture. Um, but for us, the first big one is to create a family benefit system that provides affordable access to early care and education for all families, with no family paying more than 7% of their income for services. This would dramatically expand affordability of early care and education programs through a new Great Start Minnesota program. This program would blend existing federal and state funding streams along with additional funding needed to fully support the program. Under the proposed program, all families are eligible with the maximum payment lining up with 7% of income, the income affordability standard. Our second bucket of recommendations is to provide early, child care prog or early childhood programs with adequate funding to deliver effective services for children and families. Um, we ask that the state equitably fund providers for the services they offer. Minnesota should pay programs based on the true costs of services rather than market rates, which are used um, for our current benefits programs, current rates are limited by the price families are able to pay and rather than a rate rather than a rate that would cover the full cost of care and allow for fair workforce compensation. We're also asking that the early care and education workforce get paid at least a living wage. We are proposing a framework that increases early care and education wages aligned with experience and education and provides benefits, including paid time off 
and health insurance to appropriately reflect the value that early care and education workforce provides to children, families, communities, and our state. Finally, we want to invest in increasing access to effective programs to enable the early care and education workforce to make the task force vision of effectiveness, including high quality, a reality for all children and families. Minnesota needs consistent and equitable standards and growth oriented accountability systems, a healthy business environment and clear, consistently applied regulations and a cohesive, high functioning infrastructure and ecosystem to support early care and education. Thank you, I think we'll send it back to Lori. And I will unmute myself this time. Thank you so much to the Minnesota team. A lot of really fantastic work that um, kind of is culminating over this report. Um, we'll hear more about it in, uh, in a few minutes when we uh, get into a discussion. So I'm excited to introduce Kayla Rosen, from the Rhode Island team, and we'll take the next slide as well. Thanks so much, Lori, and I'm so happy to be here with my colleagues, um, uh, Lisa Nugent at the Department of Education and Nicole Cello from the Department of Human Services. Um, as folks know, Rhode Island is a small state. We're small but mighty. So there's about eight of us who do absolutely everything. So you'll see us in different combinations, but we really work well together across agencies um, and across systems. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. So, you know, we have a long history of collaborating across systems to achieve our shared goals in early learning. Currently, our state's strategic plan is anchored by five core goals. Uh, the first is to increase access to high quality, affordable early education for children zero to five, ensure equitable access to timely targeted services, implement universal pre-K, improve system governance and financial sustainability and alignment, and use data to inform initiatives and investments. Um, we have a lot of projects underway, like our fellow states on the call today, and I'm sure everyone listening, um, including we're exploring the creation of an office of early learning, we're implementing innovative career pathways for early educators, we're piloting compensation strategies and more. Today, we wanted to really highlight our work to expand Rhode Island pre-K as an example of the type of interagency work that is allowing us to leverage multiple systems and funding streams to achieve our shared goals for young children and families. So Rhode Island Pre-K, um, we're very proud, is one of the six programs in the country to meet all 10 of NEAR's quality criteria. Um, and since 2009, our program has expanded to uh, about 2,300 seats. Uh, again, Rhode Island is small. Our birth cohorts are about 11,000 kids per birth cohort. So 2,300 is a pretty good proportion of our kiddos ages four. Um, and expanding pre-K has been uh, a goal of ours for over a decade, and it's been consistent across the many different iterations of plans we've had from the Pre-Kindergarten Education Act in 2008, shepherded by advocates and by the General Assembly, to our third grade reading goal, uh, our current Early Childhood Care and Education Strategic Plan, and the Governor's Rhode Island 2030 Plan. Um, really excitingly, in the last budget that passed in June, uh, we were charged between the Children's Cabinet, which I facilitate, the Department of Education and the Department of Human Services, to put together a comprehensive growth plan with annual budget projections to reach 5,000 Rhode Island pre-K seats by 2028. This is big uh, because I would be doubling the program, um, but also represents that kind of forward thinking commitment that allows us to really be thoughtful about how we expand the program. And what was great to see in the legislation was that it required that that plan include how we would support the mixed delivery system as a whole, how we would recruit and retain qualified educators, and how we'd actually support the infant toddler sector. Too often when we talk about pre-K, we just talk about pre-K, um, but we don't think about the impact on the rest of the system. This actually demanded that we do, which is exactly how we want to be thinking about it. And it was great to see that charge um, from legislative leadership as well. So uh, building on kind of all of our existing shared governance structures, the work we've been doing with PDG, um, we developed a comprehensive plan um, similar to our colleagues. It was about 65 pages, not quite the 92 that you just mentioned. Um, and we delivered it on December 30th, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, which we're really excited about. Next slide, please. So I uh, just wanna give a high level set of what the recommendations were in that plan. 
Um, just to, again, exemplify the type of interagency uh, investments that we want to see that's required when we think about the holistic system. So the first was that we are actually poised to expand pre-K with our existing framework. We've been committed to the mixed delivery system from the outset in Rhode Island pre-K. Um, and we want to make sure that we're continuing to maximize family choice by letting families matriculate where they might already be, by choosing programs uh, potentially across district lines, because right now you have to be within your school district, um, and exploring those types of options. And we want to continue to optimize all of the public investments across early learning. As some of you may know from other webinars, we've been able to uh, braid funds with Head Start, with CCAP, and with our Rhode Island pre-K dollars to be able to, again, maximize choice for families and support programs sustainably. The second uh, uh, recommendation was to make targeted investments across the mixed delivery system to allow classrooms to become ready for expansion. We know that many of the classrooms we already have are the early adopters who are ready to become Rhode Island pre-K. To double the size of the program, we need to support the next cohort of programs to be ready. And that allows us to invest in quality support across the system um, so that we were actually kind of raising all boats when it comes to quality. The third recommendation was about developing, piloting, and implementing additional program models to meet the expansion goals. Right now, we don't have Rhode Island Pre-K for three-year-olds. What does it look like to incorporate three-year-olds in the program in a really thoughtful way? We also spent a lot of time talking about early childhood special education, which is an area that I don't think always gets the attention it deserves. But we know our kids who are evaluated to have IEPs at age three don't always have access to high quality programming, don't always have the same, you know, uh, the, the timing of when they switch from EI to early childhood special education impacts where they can go. We want to make sure that our students with special needs have equitable access to Rhode Island Pre-K, and we want to make sure that that includes whether their district boundaries, whether it's in the mixed delivery system, how we can make that happen. We also want to think about Rhode Island Pre-K and family child care. We currently don't have um, FCCs as part of the Rhode Island Pre-K mixed delivery system. We wanted to think about what that looks like going forward, and we want to make sure that we're supporting multilingual learners. I'm sure like many states, a big proportion of our young children are multilingual learners, yet they're not assessed for MLL status until they get to kindergarten. We want to think about how we help kids earlier. The um, fourth bullet <laughs> um, is that we want to invest in ongoing program sustainability and operations to maintain quality. We have not raised the base grant amount for Rhode Island Pre-K in a decade, but we know that costs continue to go up. So how can we make sure that we're increasing the amount with inflation so that way it remains a sustainable program. And fifth, we want to make aligned investments across the mixed delivery system. So our report actually included a recommendation uh, similar to what Illinois is doing of having an infant toddler set aside. So we're making aligned investments in infant toddler at the same time as pre-K, um, as well as investments in early childhood special education. So go to the next slide. So some of our next steps, uh, we just submitted that report. So we're hoping to see um, some investments in this next year's budget. But in the meantime, we were granted a $4 million uh, one-year PDG B5 planning grant from ACF, which we're incredibly grateful for. That's going to allow us to take some of the next steps we had recommended in the report, including enhanced family engagement and support. How can we um, recruit families into Rhode Island pre-K so they know about the opportunity? as well as review and design the pre-K lottery to be more accessible for families? How can we develop those new models that I talked about? And how can we invest in infant toddler capacity, including a wage supplement program for early educators and infant toddler to try to support recruitment in that sector, um, as well as doing some aligned infant toddler strategic planning uh, to kind of be a corollary plan to Rhode Island pre-K, so that we were really looking at both parts of the system. Um, so that's just an example of the type of interagency work that's really possible when you bring the different systems together and uh, just building on our shared history of strategic planning in Rhode Island. I'll pass it back to you, Lori. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you so much. I do want to encourage you to, um, now that you've heard kind of a high-level overview from each state, what their system is, what their recent accomplishment is, um, submit questions. We will take those in a few minutes. We're about to um, move into a 
time of reflection and discussion. I'm going to um, ask some questions of each of the panelists so that we could kind of get under the hood and uh, in their states, if you will, to understand more about about what they did and how they how they did it and how they made these accomplishments. So, thanks to each of the states for the overview. Uh, right now, we want to delve a little deeper, and so I'm going to begin with Shakira. And uh, Shakira, can you tell us about your role on the Great Start for All Minnesotans Task Force? What you think the task force has accomplished, uh, you know, in your in your own mind, and from the perspective of a parent. I serve as one of the three co-chairs on the task force. Um, we convene our group monthly to advance our work. I also served on our family and provider affordability working group to develop recommendations specifically in that area. Family affordability is an issue that is near and dear to me, as I currently have two children in the ECE system. Um, I have also learned a bit about the early care and education workforce through my time on the task force, and I know how much they deserve higher compensation and more support. My children and our family are so attached to their teachers. <laughs> we know how important consistency is in their lives and what a difference early child care educators make. So our task force is about to wrap up work together, and we've accomplished so much. <laughs> Through lots of open discussions, we were able to come up with lots of recommendations to move our state forward. We didn't always agree on everything, but each of the recommendations have received a majority of votes from our voting members. Um, building consistency was, in, consensus was an important part of the process. We put together a robust report that contains big recommendations for our state to invest in ECE, which we know is investing in our future. Um, and we heard from Jenny a bit more specifically about our recommendations, and we're looking forward to see how the state legislature will carry our work forward. Thanks. Thank you, Shakira. Appreciate that. Um, Karen, in Washington, um, can you tell us more about the Fair Start Act? How did it change the policy landscape for e ECE? And talk a little bit about the entitlement to serve all preschoolers um, by 2026-27. Absolutely. Thanks, Lori. So there are so many policy changes that have resulted from the Fair Start for Kids Act um, legislation. Um, in child care, as Nicole said, it capped co-pays, expanded eligibility, and increased supports for family, friends, and neighbor providers as well. And there is corresponding policy for that uh, now in place. It, uh, it provided health care for child care providers mm -hmm. and exp expanded funding opportunities and grant opportunities that has related and changed policy as well around supporting children with complex needs in classroom settings to reduce uh, or eliminate expulsion where it is occurring, translation and better support for children who have dual, uh, who are dual language learners, um, supports for the field around trauma-informed supports and care, there have been equity grants and then increased funding for therapeutic intervention services for children birth to five. Specifically for pre-K programming or ECAP, uh, it changed the, um, when we moved from F federal poverty level to state median income, uh, it, it, it increased the uh, number of families who would be income eligible for our state funded pre-K. So previously it had been 110% FPL, it moved it to 36% state median income. Um, children are eligible on an IEP that didn't change, but we expanded by adding in children who were currently experiencing homelessness or who had participated in Part C services in our state. We also had a very specific piece for tribal children. All tribal children in Washington are eligible for ECAP services um, at or below 100% of the state median income. And it increased policy changes around the children who um, are allowable to be enrolled into ECAP services up to 50% SMI. So a really big expansion of the families who would be eligible and could uh, receive services. You and, and the staff were very, very busy then with all that policy change and then the related we were. <laughs> implementation. We could probably talk a lot more about that as well, but we, and we'll save that mm -hmm. as a question. Um, but Nicole um, Cello, uh, 
from your perspective in Rhode Island, uh, what do you think is the greatest opportunity for expanding Rhode Island's uh, hot, you know, mixed delivery pre-K program? And what's the greatest challenge? Thank you, Laurie. That's actually a really great question. It's really challenging to think of just one opportunity as there's really a number of great things when thinking about the high quality mixed delivery pre-K. Um, philosophically, the ability for child, for any type of children from all different types of child care programs, particularly family child care, to be a part of a high quality pre-K system and, and really trying to identify and work, look at what that looks like is really exciting. From an operational standpoint, the continued opportunity to work collaboratively with my wonderful colleague at the Rhode Island Department of Education, Lisa Nugent, um, towards that really one shared goal has been incredibly beneficial in such a short period of time here in Rhode Island. And it's really exciting to think about what else we can do with this collaboration to really benefit Rhode Island's children. Um, when you start to think about the opportunities, the greatest challenge a little bit aligns with the greatest opportunity, and that's the working across multiple agencies. Um, it's really, <laughs> it's really challenging. It can be very challenging to do work collaboratively with two very distinct, very large agencies and all of the systems of checks and balances that kind of come with moving anything forward in one agency, never mind multiple. So I would definitely say, while well, it's a super exciting opportunity, it is also very challenging for us here at Rhode Island. Just curious, do you think it's getting easier now that you've kind of like paved the way with a few of the joint things? So there's, you know, some kind of hope for the future? I, I would say yes, I would say. Okay. I would say that we've definitely like crossed uh, uh, the hard threshold. The hill is, it, it might be still a little bit uphill, but it's a lot like less steep. We've definitely okay. paved the way and it's exciting. Okay, great. Thank you. It, it is always challenging, right? It takes longer to collaborate even than it does to work on your own, but that's great. Glad to hear it. Um, Sandy, uh, in Minnesota, it was so delightful to talk to you on the prep call. So what was it like for you co-chairing the task force um, with so much writing on the recommendations? Um, you know, it's pretty impressive that the legislature established this and put some resources behind it and some support to you all. So what kept you up at night and what makes you the most happiest? Oh, thank you, Lori. And that is really a good question. Um, I'm, uh, I was really honored and surprised to be selected to be on the task force to begin with. And then to be asked to be co-chair was a complete shock and such an honor. And so it made me so happy to be able to be a part of something that's really gonna make a difference for children and families in Minnesota on one hand. On the other hand, I was terrified that somehow I was gonna mess it up because it's so <laughs> important. And this has been what, what my life's work has been about is really supporting especially disenfranchised children and families. But it, the other co-chairs, Shakira and Jenny have been so wonderful to work with. And Hannah has just kept us on track and really laid out a process, which has worked very well. And I just have to say that the opportunity to link arms with all the advocates and other people who are doing this work in Minnesota and together for us to come to agreement and to move forward with something is such a thrill. But I'm still, I mean, we have one meeting left and I'm still like, Ooh, don't mess it up, Sandy, because it, it is, it's really important. But I also want to encourage other states that it is important to have practitioners part of the process, because then you also have an opportunity to be able to provide input and makes it um, really um, beneficial across the state. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, and and it, it, it's must have been delightful really to have two other folks to work with really so that you each could share share your nightmares and your successes as well so good for you thank you um nicole um as the assistant secretary for early learning in washington's dcyf tell us more about the proviso fund it's not actually a word i was i was familiar with and a little bit more about the goals and maybe even the process of the joint report with uh, with your Office of uh, Public Instruction. 
Yeah, thanks, Lori. It's a, it's a great question. And as folks were talking about um, working across agencies, I realized that one thing I didn't share is that in Washington State, um, the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction is a completely separate agency, and the Superintendent of Public Instruction is actually a, an elected official. And so you have an elected official overseeing essentially your Department of Ed, and then the Department of Children, Youth, and Families is a cabinet level agency. And so the, the budget proviso really was a way to get dollars to both the, the Department of Children, Youth, and Families and the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction and the governor's way of asking us uh, to work together to really think about um, how we're serving as many three and four-year-olds as possible with transitional kindergarten really focused on four-year-olds and ECAP really focused on three and four-year-olds. And so um, as I shared before, some of the big things of this really are about administrative efficiencies. And so mm -hmm. uh, for some folks, part of what that means is how does all of this intersect and play with our, our licensing? Who's required to be licensed? What does that look like when you may be um, in a school building and you're offering not only state-funded preschool, but you may be offering transitional kindergarten and you may be offering um, childcare that's wrap around, wrapping around both of those things. So what does that mean for that individual who um, is operating that? How are we thinking about uh, quality together? Uh, knowing that there is a system of quality in the K-12 system and what we've defined as quality and early learning. And so sometimes that's really just doing some crosswalking and talking about what that looks like. But I think your question too about how does all of this work and come together? Again, it's not just Karen and Nicole and uh, the assistant superintendent at OSPI and the director of early learning at OSPI having these conversations. Um, this really has been a process um, that Karen and team have really led over the last couple of years, several years actually, of bringing folks together to really talk about what this means. And there has been some real intentional focus as well on how we think about inclusion and how we're really meeting the needs of our littles who um, need access to developmental preschool and what that looks like. And one of the things I would also say is that we've really tried to leverage some of the other funding opportunities in our state or federal funding opportunities. So we've taken a look at what we're doing with our birth to five preschool development grant around some of our pyramid approach and multi-tiered system of support implementation and really thinking about how we use these opportunities to continue to bring that forward. Um, I mentioned our educational service districts, which are districts that support each of our school districts in Washington state. They are huge partners in this, as well as uh, child care aware. But I think at the end of the day, the goal is really, how are we serving as many children as possible with high quality services? How are we making that easier for families and easier for our adult professionals who are providing this as well? Thank you. I have one small follow up for you all, actually for anybody, but Nicole in particular, I, it occurred to me is um, assuming that you've had to kind of ramp up your data system so that you are keeping track of, you know, how all this expansion is trending towards meeting your eligibility and other things. So can you say anything about like how do you know if this is working and what kind of data are you collecting and reports that you're giving to the legislature? So that is that is a great question. And I think we could probably all spend all day <clears throat> talking about data and data systems and how they uh, work and talk to one another. Um, I think there's a couple of things um, that I would share. One, both state-funded pre-K as well as our K-12 system, so including transitional kindergarten, are something that are forecasted by our caseload forecast council out of our Office of Financial Management. So they are really watching as these policy changes come into play to see how many more children and families are getting access to these services. Um, so that's one piece that's happening. Um, the second thing that's happening is I talked about coordinated recruitment and enrollment. You know, there is a statewide steering committee that has come together. And one of the things that they have really talked about is how do we get information about all of these programs into one spot so that families know what's actually available. And it's not only about 
um, what is offered in my community, but real time, what is actually available in the moment when I need it. We are a long ways from being able to do that, um, but it is something that comes up in conversation. So I think those are the two big ways that we're, we've looked at that right now, but I wanna um, give Karen an opportunity to jump in if there's anything she wants to add. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to turn to uh, the last question for this part anyway. Uh, so Lisa Nugent in Rhode Island. And as Pre-K expands, how are you working um, at the department or with your colleagues really to build a continuum of early learning into the early grades? So once they're in Pre-K, either three or I mean, hopefully threes and then fours, now going into um, you know kindergarten through third grade. So we actually have four things that we're working on right now. Um, I think it helps that, again, we are small. So Kayla and Nicole and I are on calls multiple times a week, which gave the early learning team here at the Department of Ed people to actually talk to and collaborate with and work with on some of those pieces that we wanted to see expand better in the K-12 world. Um, coming from child care myself, K-12 was a little foreign to me. Um, I'm not your typical Department of Ed employee. So it, it, it was very different. Um, I find that our early learning landscape and our QRIS and our childcare licensing do a really great job at holding our early years accountable and measuring quality. Don't always see the same type of accountability in the K-12 world. Uh, it's a little bit different. We're a locally controlled state, so there's only kind of so much you can do. And so one of my colleagues works on a kindergarten transition plan with our pre-Ks to really help connect parents to the public school. They do mm -hmm. things such as offering registration at the child care center, going to where the kids are. There have been videos made that are absolutely adorable with the kindergartners showing the pre-K kids where they're going to hang their coats up and trying to really make that connection for them. We've had kindergarten teachers come in and teach in our pre-Ks, and we've had some of our pre-K teachers go in and teach in our kindergartens so they can see how the other half lives. Um, on top of that, we also have the first 10 project going on in some of our districts right now, which has been really helpful on trying to map out what that's going to look like after that transition from pre-K. Um, I know for those of you who have kids or have been around kids as, as child care, we are constantly communicating with parents. We see them at pick up and drop off and you have that time to make that connection. And then you go to K-12 and maybe they're on the bus so you don't see the teacher every day. And how do we support parents in getting the information they need once their child goes to the public school, um, which has been very important. On our end, the biggest thing that we're doing right now is we're about to move um, some legislation forward that our public schools will be mandated to be part of our state's QRIS system. And Your so public this, school preschools? Yes, all okay. of our public school preschools. Okay. And so what that will be able to help us with is not only bring up the level of quality in those programs, but also for those principals to see what does high quality childcare look like? Because that should also be in your kindergarten program, probably should also be in your first grade program. They don't quite know what they're looking for. And this is really going to bring that into light so that they have it in their buildings, they can see what it looks like. Um, and we're very excited about that piece of legislation that's moving forward. Uh, and the last piece is in our K-12 world, we um, are really moving to high quality curriculum adoption. Okay. And so they're using ed reports to make sure that their curriculum is actually a, a green curriculum. And that is truly helping the quality level go up and the understanding go up, so. Curriculum is really important. There's a webinar later today. I'm going to join the National Academy of Sciences has a study of pre-K curriculum and thinking that through just a, a little follow up, Lisa, do you require a certain a research based curriculum and yes. implementation, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So in okay, our um, RI pre-Ks, we have a list of endorsed curriculums that have gone through the rigor through here. And then in our K-12, they're actually using ed reports and they have to have a green gateway curriculum uh, and implement that way. 
Great, thanks so much. Um, I'm sorry, I had one other. I'm not sure everybody knows what Big Ten is. I think you said or the uh, the first ten project. First ten, sorry. <laughs> so uh, my colleague works on that, and she's working with that. Through, I, I believe with EDC, and it's right. really the first ten years of life. Right. And and okay. connecting families. Right. And it's a community based project. Yes. So just so that others, in case we see, we have a couple questions coming in, but I'm going to hold them off for a moment. Um, um, but thank you all so much. That was really helpful. I, I love having this conversation. So I just wanted to give each state uh, a moment to say what's next or to add anything else, because some of you said what, what was next in your in your presentation, but to just have a couple of minutes to um, kind of conclude this part. And then in a few minutes, we'll go to the questions that have be, are being submitted. So now's the time. And then after that, um, we'll have Elena share about the uh, resources that can support you in your work in building an aligned system. So. Uh, right now, I'll turn it to Kayla. I know you had a next step slide, but was there anything else you'd like to add um, in your position or for Rhode Island? Um, yeah, just just happy to say, I know we focused on pre-K, but really, as we think about where we're going, it, it's the whole system. And so for us, we're, we're focused right now in particular on what does that corollary plan look like for infant toddler um, to make sure that we have its clearer set of goals and strategies around our zero to threes um, to make sure that we're aligning the system as a whole. Um, we also, like every state, talk every day about compensation. Um, <laughs> so we want to make sure that we are thinking about how we're getting to a place of pay parity um, and fair pay uh, for our early educators, which, you know, that's a very big problem and would have been easier if Build Back Better had passed. Um, in lieu of that, we're in a really hard situation, but there's there are things that we can do and want to make sure that we're continuing to be as innovative as we can. Um, and like I said, we're leveraging PDG uh, as an example to do that. I have to say that I've worked a lot with the PDG B5 states over the years, and I think that that's been a very powerful uh tool, funding, and resources from the federal government to move systems building forward. It's rare that we get funding um, for a real systems building, and we need it. So thank you so much. Um, Karen, did you, would you like to say anything more about maybe what, what you're looking forward to um, in the next few years, what you, what you think you will be working on for your, your systems building in Washington? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Lori. So, um, Obviously, we're going to be continuing our joint work with our partners at OSPI um, with specific focus around the coordinated recruitment and enrollment, and then really looking at how we can expand that. Um, we also have some really strong partnerships that we've been working on um, through OSPI funding around um, working to make sure that we're uh, providing integrated services between ECAP and developmental pre-K, so leveraging that. So we, we both sides of the house there are really interested in expanding that. The continued alignment and integration work that's happening with childcare programming and, um, you know, work related funding uh, connected to childcare. Uh, we have some things that we need to do specifically within ECAP around really being clear what uh, we need to do to have ECAP you know, reach entitlement as we uh, as we get closer to that goal uh, in 26-27. And then I think for us, we we have some very exciting pathway work that we're doing specifically in ECAP uh, for smaller providers, so that we're trying to create easier pathways for family home providers and smaller childcare providers to provide state funded pre K. Uh, and then um, some specific pathway work for developmental pre-K and school district providers. And then our longest pathway really is with tribal providers and um, meeting our government to government obligations that has resulted in significant increased eligibility for tribal children. We're moving towards um, creating tribal, tribal compacts versus contracting with tribes in the future as well, which is very exciting and we're looking forward to that. What does a compact mean versus a contract? Meaning so compact, an agreement kind of? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it just, it, it honors our government to government relationship with tribes and okay. it 
really has us um, giving them, they have more sovereignty ultimately in, in determining the services moving forward um, while still making sure that they're meeting the requirements that are in law and are in WAC. Great. Um, I'm going to start this what this question out. It's going to be for anybody, but I'll ask um, you know the Minnesota team to possibly start. Um, and the question is, does any state have Parent Nation or some other similar program incorporated in your work? Um, you know, by the nature that you have a parent co-chairing, you're obviously seeking to develop the leadership of parents. Are there other any formalized? programs or strategies that um, any state is doing really to support parent parent leadership? Sure, I can get started. I think okay. I'll just share quickly about uh, Minnesota's next steps. Like clearly it's, we wanna deliver our report in a few weeks and make sure <laughs> that gets out there. Um, but we're also working as co-chairs to empower our members to continue to advocate for our recommendations. Um, and then as many of you mentioned, really taking that coordinated approach to the work, both internally to state government and externally. Um, and then I just want to share a quick highlight um, because I hope that our task force members, interestingly enough, as part of our plan, we were asked to, or recommendations to create a plan for implementation to begin in 2025. And we are just like over the moon that our governor's budget has taken some of these recommendations into account and they're work helping us proposing steps that could help us work towards those um, towards realization of our vision. And so some of that of what's included in our administration's budget budget is child and dependent tax credits, funding for our early learning scholarships program, which would expand eligibility for zero to three and prioritize parents who are or children who are who have parents who are incarcerated, increasing our CCAP rates, um, creating more opportunities for mixed delivery pre-K. We also have some family navigation tools, community resource centers and hubs, and then really thinking about how we, um, we heard, as many of you have mentioned, the compensation piece and the importance of the stabilization grants in Minnesota. 70% of the stabilization grants must have been used for compensation. And the administration Administration's budget, budget proposal has what is being called retention payments, which would require 100% of the funding to go to compensation. Um, and then again, we had had a recommendation to explore what governance is needed and the governor's budget proposes establishing a new agency that would consolidate early childhood um, and, and um, create a transition that would allow for bringing youth and other family programs in. Um, so I think we, we wanna really center children and families in all that we do. And I would just highlight that another piece of work separate from the Great Start Task Force that um, is really this parent leadership piece is our preschool development grant through work with child welfare at, at the Department of Human Services is standing up a parent leadership program. Um, and uh, you know, that will be a, our work over the next year. But so we're really trying, we're just getting started with that work here, formalized work, I would say in Minnesota. Thank you, and I apologize. <laughs> I went to the questions before I asked you to say what, what you were looking forward to. I appreciate you you adding that. Um, did anybody else from the other states want to talk at all about either parent nation or parent leadership? I, I would just note in Washington state that we do have a parent advisory group that um, meets and talks about all things DCYF. And then our Washington State Association of Head Start and ECAP um, for many years now has um, put together what they call parent ambassadors um, who really are ambassadors for Head Start, ECAP, child care subsidy. Um, and they go through um, some leadership training and in fact are up on the hill right now advocating for things as we're in legislative session. And so it's um, really an amazing opportunity, and it's always great to see them grow and you see them in, in different roles throughout the year. So um, those are some of the things that we've done. And I know um, that ECAP does some reaching out to families directly around some of the things that are working for them, as well as all of the mobility mentoring work as well. So just um, would offer if to Karen if there's anything else she wants to add. 
Yeah, but I would just add that we have, uh, we're actually in the process of setting up a, an ECAP specific parent feedback group as well so that we can get specific parent voice uh, to the state office on key issues and areas of growth. And then um, we, we do work in multiple ways to solicit feedback from parents and families through the contractors uh, which, who have policy council requirements and other parent leadership requirements as well. Thank you. Um, there's a question for Rhode Island, um, but it may be something that others want to address that's really about how you're working to preserve infant toddler seats while expanding pre-K. Um, and Kayla, I think you mentioned that was going to be part of your next steps of work, but you may have some initial ideas and others will. I think that Whenever we talk about expanding one part of the system that serves one age group, we always want to think about, um, you know, what the impact is on other other children and ensure everybody has access to. So, do you want to say anything at all about how you're thinking about that? I know that was part of your recommendations. Absolutely. So we have um, there's kind of work that's already happened, and then work that is forthcoming to address this. So, so far, the way that we expand pre-K is through a grant award, where classrooms from across the mixed delivery system apply to the Department of Education for Rhode Island pre-K funding. As part of that application, they have to attest that no children are displaced from their current classrooms as a result of opening a pre-K. Oh, so okay. it is it is a fundamental part of the application. That has meant that many of the people who opened the program to start had an empty classroom. So they were able to take a classroom they'd never been using before in their building and turn it into a Rhode Island pre-K, meaning that no classroom was shuttered. It just created more capacity. As we've continued to expand, the uh, empty classrooms available are not as many. So what we were able to do is create new funding models that allowed programs to take existing classrooms of preschool age children, four-year-olds, and turn them into Rhode Island pre-K with pre-K com dollars coming in as kind of a last dollar funding to increase quality, to be able to hire that bachelor's degree teacher, whatever that piece was. Again, still with the requirement that no children were displaced as a result of opening that classroom, which has allowed us to preserve infant toddler. The other piece is that Rhode Island pre-K, by coming in as a different funding source, not based on kind of a per child cost, but really a classroom-based grant, it covers part of the rent of the building. It covers part of the utilities. It covers that kind of whole um, organization cost, which allows um, you know, the child care operator to be savvy with their budget and reinvest within other parts of their facility. We want Rhode Island Pre-K to be um, a fund source that is helping to sustain the entire system. It can't solve everything. It will not solve everything, but it can help. And so we've been able to keep programs open uh, in a couple cases because we're able to make that grant. As we go forward, though, you know, it continues to be a concern. And certainly when we talk so much about pre-K and the dollars are going there, it certainly signals to the um, system that pre-K is the investment to go after. And we certainly don't want people not to open infant toddler classrooms or choose that their next thing be pre-K and not infant toddler. We need to keep both parts of the system robust. And so some of the things we've done so far is we have uh, early childhood facilities um, bond that passed and there are priority points for those who are opening infant toddler classrooms. And some of those recommendations that I talked about in the report are kind of those forward looking, how do we continue um, to make sure that infant toddler is a prioritized area. Thank you. I'm going to open that up to any of the other states because it's such an important and critical and sometimes complex issue about how how to expand both. And uh, somebody else earlier said, you know, keep all all boats afloat. Uh, there is some needs to be some intentionality around how you're supporting the infant toddler seats. I know in in Washington you had a burst to three pilot. Am I right about ECAP? So I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but just to take a couple of minutes before we close out the Q&A time and go to resources, um, since that's a, such an important topic for folks. Yes, we, we through PDG grant funding, we 
Uh, we piloted a birth to three ECAP programming. Uh, we have 178 thoughts, so it's small, uh, and is um, there is high demand for more of that. And you know, we have worked through you know our decision package process to incorporate it into stabilization across childcare and a specific focus on our um, infant toddler system as well. So. Um, and those that funding has now moved out of PDG and is uh, has the state is funding it. So that's um, fantastic. We yeah. So we have the seeds. We planted the seeds, and we have something that now is established that we are hopeful will grow over time. And I will say that I did a report for uh, PDG B five Alabama did a similar pilot of their pre K program with for birth to three got some good data and were able to go to the legislature and uh, got some sustainable funding. So I think that that's really important to pilot, see what needs to happen and um, get data on it. Uh, anybody, uh, Jenny do you, or anybody from Minnesota? Wanna? Sure, so we, to go back to some of our original recommendations, it really does go back to some of the cost of care versus right. cost. Um, the market rates and thinking about that. And then also some of the work that is planned through this next round of the preschool development grant funding is really some human centered design around mixed delivery. And that's another way that we're also trying to do some work around um, pay parity um, for compensating participation of a variety of, of um, mixed delivery educators to participate in this with us to really think about what, what will it take to make this successful to ensure that infants and toddlers have access to care, as well as the three and four year olds that we plan to do. And we're really trying to do this very locally. And in, in some of the proposed legislation, which we tried to propose last time, but if you tuned into Minnesota, not a lot happened in our <laughs> legislative slash session this past year, but we're very hopeful for this year, um, was really to think about local planning because many communities, as we've, as the other states have talked about also, like there are unique needs for children and families. And we don't know that what will work in Roseau will work in Rochester, will work in Duluth. And so trying to think about that planning more locally. So really providing some compensation and, and um, facilitation to have that conversation and planning happen. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And thank you to all of the state presenters. Um, I learned some new things today, and I hope those listening did as well. So we're going to move now to some resources for everybody. Um, as I mentioned, we'll, we are sponsoring, and it's out on many listservs um, and in our various newsletters, that we'll be uh, hosting a peer learning community. Uh, building Equitable Systems for Tomorrow's Children. It's uh, funded by the Alliance for Early Success, and it's really designed to bring together state teams who want to work together on thinking about what's next. How could they move um, forward in building a fully equitable and aligned system for young children? Prenatally through the early years of schooling is kind of our North Star, but taking you where you're at, and we'll be doing a series of um, kind of consultations and meetings together, learning from each other, as well as individual TA. So I encourage you to apply for that. Um, it's due on Monday, the 23rd, but if you're very, if you're interested, you can um, reach out to me and we can, we can chat if you need a little bit more time. Very simple application. Uh, so now I'm excited to uh, introduce you to Elena Shearer. She is the uh, Federal Project Officer out of the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, ASPE, and HHS. She's been leading um, a project called the Early Childhood Systems Collective Impact Project, and they've developed a set of tools and then a set of recommendations for the federal government. A lot of um, the work that you all are doing in states needs to be supported and kind of um, there's a bi-directionality and dependence, interdependence on federal reg regulation being aligned and federal funding being aligned that then flows down to the states and that would facilitate um, administrative efficiencies and increased access. So I'm going to turn it over to Elena now um, to share with us a little bit about that project and some of the resources that they've invested in to support your work. 
Thanks so much, Lori. I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about the Early Childhood Systems Collective Impact Project. I want to first acknowledge our partners at the Health Resources and Services Administration's Maternal and Child Health Bureau for their partnership and funding for this work. Next slide, please. Uh, just a quick note that I'm here representing myself and not the official position of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Next slide, please. I just wanted to start off by saying I'm so impressed by all of the innovative and exemplary work being done uh, in Washington State, Minnesota, and Rhode Island. Um, our hope is that the Early Childhood Systems Collective Impact Project is really aligned with the work that you're all doing. And our project really aimed to re-envision a coordinated approach to program, to program implementation that can advance equitable early childhood and family well-being outcomes. As you can see from the figure on this screen, we took a really comprehensive and multi-generational vision of what the early childhood system is. Uh, we recognize that families don't live their lives in our program silos, and so it was really important for us um, to think about a comprehensive system that included programs that serve expectant parents, children ages zero to eight, and their families, all that share a goal of thriving children and families. Next slide, please. Again, the states you've heard from today are all really excellent examples of the innovation that states can accomplish within our existing authorities. Uh, but through our project activities and over the years, we've really heard that lack of alignment and coordination of requirements at the federal level is a significant barrier to the ability of states to really do robust and sustainable systems building work. So uh, in partnership with uh, MCHB, ASPE funded a team at Mathematica and the Center for the Study of Social Policy to engage in really deep analysis and conversations with the field to identify and facilitate opportunities and develop recommendations for alignment, coordination, and equity across federal early childhood programs. We centered our work on five elements of interest for looking at alignment and coordination that we see as key levers for change, as you can see in the figure on the slide. Uh, so these elements include eligibility criteria, needs assessments, outcomes and performance measures, well-being metrics, and equity. Next slide, please. In addition to a series of interviews with states and federal staff that you can find a summary of on our website, the Mathematica and CSSP team did a deep analysis of federal statute regulation and guidance uh, across early childhood programs. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna walk really quickly through these tools and then show a quick example of how they can be used together to answer key questions of interest. So first we developed a catalog, which is a really detailed compilation of information from federal statutes, regulations, and program guidance across 36 federal programs um, across the five key program elements described earlier. The catalog is an Excel spreadsheet and includes separate tabs for each source. So a tab for statute, a tab for regulation, and a tab for guidance. We then have a crosswalk that aggregates the detailed information in the catalog to highlight dimensions of those elements, both within and across programs. We then have a synthesis document that really pulls out the key findings on whether and how programs align in their requirements across those five elements. And there are two supporting documents available as well, including a methods memo that provides source uh, documentation for statute and regulation and guidance, and then a how to use document that describes how individuals can navigate and use the catalog crosswalk and synthesis together. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna walk really quickly through just one example focused on eligibility that demonstrates how uh, we think folks could use the documents together. So just one approach is that users could first review the catalog to gain a clear understanding of federal program requirements, and then turn to the crosswalk and synthesis to examine whether other programs have similar requirements. So in this example on the slide, we I know the font is small, we don't expect you to be able to read the font, um, but just wanna walk through. Here you can see catalog entries reporting program eligibility requirements for three programs, SNAP, Head Start, and TANF. And you can see in the bottom, you're looking at the statute tab. So you're looking at information on eligibility requirements for three programs. And we include eligibility information at the state level, at the program level, and at the individual level. Next slide, please. When we turn to the crosswalk, you can see how that information from the catalog is translated into the crosswalk. So as you just saw, um, in the catalog, all of the eligibility information is reported in one column. 
the crosswalk then translates those dimensions into multiple columns. So you see the same programs, SNAP, Head Start, and TANF, and the uh, different dimensions include things like whether states have discretion to define their means-tested requirements, what that means-tested threshold is, and whether there's any cross-program eligibility. So whether eligibility in one program confers eligibility in another program. Next slide, please. And here you can see just a screenshot of those findings related to cross-program eligibility in the synthesis. So you can see how um, these three documents really tie together to help answer key questions. And again, this is just one way to use these documents. Users could also choose to start with a synthesis to obtain counts of how prevalent requirements are across programs, and then turn to the crosswalk to identify uh, uh, programs with or without certain requirements, and then move to the catalog for more detailed uh, statutory or regulatory language. Next slide, please. So as I shared earlier, one of our goals for the project was to really gather recommendations to improve alignment and coordination across programs. And the Mathematica and CSSP team developed 10 recommendations for federal actions to build a coordinated and comprehensive early childhood system. And these recommendations were drawn from all project activities, including the catalog and crosswalk um, and conversations with folks in the field. Each recommendation has a list of sub-recommendations or actions one that focus on, focuses on systems level coordination across federal agencies to advance a unified system, and a second section that individual program offices can take to promote systems building to their uh, individual grant recipients. So next slide, please. So I'm just going to quickly walk through the high level recommendations and really encourage you to take a look at our website for the more detailed action steps included in each. Uh, so the first set of recommendations focus on building a foundation for interagency coordination at the federal level and includes things like a supportive infrastructure, a shared vision and guiding framework, and common definitions. Next slide, please. The next set of recommendations focus on aligning and coordinating program elements through streamlined eligibility requirements, uh, needs assessments, and common outcomes measures. Next slide, please. And then a set of recommendations focused on it, um, involving and empowering people to build and sustain the system through elevating family voice uh, and building a um, capable and well-respected and diverse and well-compensated service delivery workforce. And then finally, um, recommendations for improved federal data and coordinated research through integrated data systems and a research agenda. So I know this was a very quick overview, um, but overall, these recommendations reflect a series of actions that the project activities told us could both individually and collectively create progress towards achieving this comprehensive and coordinated early childhood system that supports equitable child and family health and well-being. The project produced an amazing array of ideas, including recommendations that range from those that could be accomplished in the short term and with current flexibilities, to those that are really aspirational and might require significant time, effort, and resources to implement. And while the primary focus of this project was to generate recommendations that address unintended federal barriers to systems coordination, we know that many of these recommendations can and are being implemented in states, tribes, and localities, and we really encourage you to consider what um, recommendations can help to facilitate and sustain a coordinated and aligned system in your state. So thank you very much. Uh, we're really pleased to share this project with you. Thank you, thank you Elena. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually really impressed with the materials and the resources. A number of the state folks talked about working on coordinated eligibility and enrollment, and that is happening across a number of states. So I imagine the tool and the crosswalk could really, really help with that. A lot of times I know I've heard and experienced that that there is um, a belief that you're not able to, uh, you know, eligibility doesn't align, but then if, if you look deeper, there is actually the opportunity to do so. So a question I had, oh, I have two questions, Elena. One is if folks do have questions about how you use the crosswalk or the tools or the tabs or anything like that, um, is it on the website how, who they would contact? Uh, so, um, yes, and actually in the next slide is our, con on, I, okay. so the next slide, our contact information is there as well. We're happy to answer questions as is the project team, um, from that. Okay. Yeah. The, on, in the resources tab is the link 
uh, to the project website, which has a lot of information. Um, the other is, Elena, I'm curious as to the recommendations. I know there had been some work at the federal level with an interagency coordination. So where are these going? What authority does ASPE have, say, to move them forward and make them turn them into an action? <laughs> Thanks so much for that question. So um, we contracted with, with two research firms to really tell us what needs to happen. So we at the federal level are still in the process of really reviewing these closely and thinking about what um, actions might be most promising and actionable. And we look forward to sharing more about um, where we're taking uh, our next steps in the coming months, but we are looking at these closely and thinking about, um, you know, again, what what of these recommendations are most promising and actionable for us to start with. Great, thanks. Well, I hope I hope you're able to make some progress, and if we get to have a webinar in a year, we we see that progress. But um, we're about to the conclusion, and I want to thank everybody who joined us today, uh, whether it's morning or afternoon, for you all. Um, it's been uh, really fascinating um, and actually humbling because each of these folks have worked very hard over many years, represent tons of folks behind them and uh, supporting them. So thank you so much. Um, we are really in this together. To uh, every time I, I I've been at this for a long time, and I and I think of every um, every child I ever ever worked with, and we want each of them to have a fantastic experience every day, every year. Um, as well as their parents. So thank you, you, everybody, for your fantastic work in this regard. Feel free to reach out to uh, myself or Aaron, um, and you'll be getting uh, links, as I said, to the materials, and we look forward to con our continued work together. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the afternoon, and thank you so much to our state presenters. Each of you um, really added a fantastic perspective and important insights. So thank you. Have a great day.